Okay, so thank you everybody for attending this um, online version of the Thursday AFT seminar. Today we have with us uh, Juan Cruz from the Technical University of Munich, who will speak about the false vacuum decay in gauge theory. Thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, as already mentioned, we are going to be speaking about gradient effects on false vacuum decay in a gauge theory. Um, the focus should be made on the gradient effects. So that's the, the new part. So false, false vacuum decay has been around already for a couple of years and um, the previous treatments do not account for this. So this is what I will be focusing on. Uh, our setting, so our toy model will be one with a gauge field and uh, well, I will give you more details once we uh, go into them. Uh, here is the reference of the paper if you want to check, uh, check it completely in detail. This was made in collaboration with my supervisor, uh, Bjorn Garbrecht, uh, another PhD student, Wen Juan Ai, and the postdoc, Carlos Samari. And um, well, without much, much more, let's dive in. So let me start with some motivation. Why, why do we care about false vacuum decay? Well, the reason is um, given these two well-known plots um, that show the best value, uh, the best fit values at two loop in an NLO precision, uh, the, the current status of metastability of the, of the standard model, it is, it is now known that given the, the mass of the top and the mass of the Higgs, we fall in this region of, of metastability. So even up to uh, three sigma, it happens to be the case that we find ourselves in, in this metastable um, vacuum. So understanding the, how, how this possibility of decaying and how um, well this tunneling phenomena occurs is, is of utmost importance. So this is, related to tunneling phenomena. That is uh, the background I'm, I'm going to uh, mention. It, it's nothing new. It, we, we see it in, in normal, usual courses in quantum mechanics. Now we just deal with this in, in a field theoretic version, if you will. Um, the first to study this were probably Coleman and Callan in the late 70s. So they made reference to this bubble nucleation and, and um, the fate of, of the of the universe in a way because uh, well they, they found out this bounce solution has some some sort of spherical symmetry and once created it would expand and um, will consume everything in a way now the problem starts for us uh, with the tectonic regions and gradient effects because it, this results here make use of the effective action However, the effective action treated in a Coleman Weinberg way. And that means to compute the log dead terms or, or one PI effects, one evaluates those terms of the effective action using a, a fixed background. So the background is just, let's say the false vacuum value and nothing else. So it doesn't move and uh, all gradients and tachyonic regions are ignored. So that's the reason we want to, to, to go after a new method, a method that allows us to include these effects. So this is what I will uh, try to transmit today. How do we manage to include this into a, the computation of this uh, decay rate? Now, some background is in order. As uh, I said, this is a tunneling phenomenon. So we should think somehow about a, a simple one-dimensional quantum mechanics problem where we have some potential that has some barrier and that this this barrier uh, although in, in in the classical terms doesn't allow for a solution we know that quantum mechanically there is a non-zero probability of tunneling of transitioning to the other area so if we have something like this in mind and we have some state which is localized in, in one of the local minima which happens to be uh, let's say slightly higher than another one, then we can compute this tunneling probability, and we would find that uh, we can we can tunnel to to this lower state um, with some probability that depends mainly on the height of this barrier. Um, this is what we will be calling vacuum sectors essentially, and the higher one we refer to as the false vacuum, and the lower one 
is what we would call the true vacuum. So what we will try to compute is the decay rate from going of, of going from here to here, it, but in the in the scalar potential in, in some model. Uh, the tools that we will use or the way we, we do these computations rely heavily on Euclidean solutions and an Euclidean version of, of the theory. So first of all, to, to be able to employ a path integral and uh, be able to project out the lowest state, we will need to, to deal with an Euclidean version of the model. So first question, how do we produce this true vacuum? Um, if, if I were probably an experimentalist, I would probably order one of this and uh, get myself a vacuum decay generator, plug it in and voila. But um, well, for us, we want to, to make a bit of the, the quantification of this. So although the picture is correct and it's a good starting point, um, we, we don't have such a tool. Our tool is however, a bounce, a bounce field. So this will be denoted by phi B. And as in the picture, the profile of this field configuration is correct in the sense that it has a, a core which lies uh, in the true vacuum. Namely, the field takes the value associated to the lowest energy level. And once you start going outwards, you reach asymptotically the false vacuum. Now, this, it of course, looks like a bubble. And the, the chances that, are, that this happens in, in some uh, volume is, is what we refer as to the nucleation, nucleation of bubbles. Um, additionally, um, there have been uh, already arguments in, in these uh, papers here about the, the importance of the gradients. Namely, the argument is that gradients might be as important as one loop um, contributions. So if one were to care about loops, then we should also probably include gradients. And this is something that we, we want to check. So as, we, as I mentioned, most treatments, so most treatments rely on this coleman weinberg version where no such gradients are included. Now, this is not exactly new in, 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 this, in the general setting. So some other geometries have been studied. Also some applications to electroweak phase transition have been, have been dealt with. Uh, in particular, Professor Garbrecht and, and our group have dealt with uh, cases of a scalar uh, subject to a scaling variant potential, or the case of a scalar and a fermion coupled via Yukawa. Now, the next uh, logical step is the one up, uh, on the gauge sector. So what we want to test is this new method to include gradients in the setting of having a scalar coupled to a, a gauge boson. Now, um, if we want to go into the mathematics of this, uh, we have to paste two ideas. The first one being the computation of the ground state via this uh, uh, insertion of a completion relation, if you will. So we know that if we transform time, uh, in, if, we, if we rotate the time, we can express this transition amplitude like this. So we don't have an eye here or anything. And this allows us to take the time, the time to, to, to infinity, so consider the large times, and project out the ground state, right? Because this one will be the, the highest contribution. Alternatively, um, we could compute this transition amplitude using a path integral. So if we demand as boundary conditions that our field finds itself here and here at, at the beginning and at the end, respectively, then at the lowest order approximation, we can reach this, this approximation, right? We just have to evaluate the action at the subtle point, which, or the subtle points that, that uh, fulfill the boundary conditions. So uh, for the people that are not uh, used to doing uh, this computations in non-homogeneous backgrounds, this is no, will be no longer a value, a fixed value, but our non-homogeneous background, the bounds. So, the lowest approximation would be just to insert here the, the bounds and compute the, the contribution to the action coming from that configuration. Now, the question is how to go beyond that. So um, on the one hand, there's effective action treatments. Um, this one's uh, just as a, for the sake of completeness, 
they have been used in the past to study the st stability of the standard model. So before uh, the mass of the Higgs was known, for example, people would require that the decay rate of the vacuum was larger than the age of the universe, for example, and that would allow uh, people to draw bounds on, on the mass of the Higgs, for example. Now, we know the mass of the Higgs, and uh, perhaps the, the idea is to bound other, other uh, quantities with, with this information. For us, um, what we are going to do is to generalize the formula before that, that existed before. So if we denote by little gamma the decay rate, then the decay rate per volume is given by this uh, equation in the blue box. And as you can see, the exponent here is the one that carries the new information. So namely, we are taking here the effective action up to some order. So the argument uh, can be found in this uh, paper by Garbrecht and Millington, where they show that it, it is OK to take the effective action instead of just the partition function to, to zero's order. Now, in this paper, what we do is take the effective action to order one. So it's uh, we want to include loops, but we also want to include the loops and the gradient. So this phi one is actually the bounds plus uh, its corrections. And this quantity can be decomposed at the same time in three different quantities, three different <laughs> yeah, contributions. Um, B being the zeroth order, so just the computation of the action on the bounds. B1 will contain the loops, so um, all the 1PI sort of diagrams, and B2 will include the, the feedback of the, of the tadpoles on the, on the bounds. So as we will see further, uh, further on, the, the non-homogeneity of the background will have an impact on the bounds itself, namely it will modify the equation of motion associated to the bounds and will then uh, uh, change the, the, the bounds itself and, and include some corrections. So um, having said this, now uh, I will give you the, the questions we're after. Uh, besides extending the method to the gauge sector, we, we were also interested in studying the gauge invariance of these methods since it has been already proven and mentioned that um, quantities that are computed uh, using extremal points of the effective action are gauge independent. Uh, we wanted to, first of all, check this, if, if it's, this is the case in, in our method. And uh, moreover, uh, also speak about what happens if, if you rely not only on the extremal points, but on the vicinity, right? Since we don't necessarily use only extremal points, but also the, the vicinity of them, perhaps the, the gauge independence is, is, is lost. So we wanted a, a, a quantification of this or a check that this actually holds. Um, so let me summarize the, the questions. So question number one would be how to extend these methods to include gradients for the gauge sector. Question number two is of course quantifying them. So how big are these corrections coming from gradients? And um, if possible, see what's the impact of the gauge choice. So that these are the things we are we are after. Um, and with that said, this is the model that we use. So we are speaking here about a the simplest model that features the this phenomena that we wanted to study. So we take a U1 gauge field coupled to a complex scalar. And here I present the Euclidean Lagrangian already. So notice the kinetic term already has a plus and also the potential itself has a, a plus. So it's inverted. For gauge uh, preserving reasons, we have to deal with the phi star phi combination in the potential. And if we are uh, to have two different local minima, then we are forced to consider potentials that have a phi star phi to the third power, namely a potential that includes a phi to the sixth, if you want. So if you want to stay within polynomial potentials, then this is probably the lowest order that gives you two vacua at tree level. 
And well, sadly, this already poses some complications, but those uh, we will deal with. So in addition, we will have a gauge fixing sector. Um, this is of course needed because um, we, we want to study the some, some variation of a choice in, in this uh, arc psi family. Um, so we have two parameters to play, the, the, C, the psi and the zeta, zeta controlling the, the gauge uh, in relation to the ghosts, uh, the ghost zone, sorry. And we, also, we will also have a, a ghost sector. So the, the fact that we are dealing with a U1 uh, gauge theory doesn't imply immediately that the ghosts decouple because of the gradients themselves. So the gradients of the background will keep the ghosts coupled. Um, again, for the sake of completeness here, I write the partition function where J, K, Psi bar and Psi are external currents. So these will allow us to compute endpoint functions by taking uh, functional derivatives and evaluating them at, at zero. So, so far, uh, very standard. Now, if there is one slide uh, to take back home would be this one. So this one is our plan. This one is our method, our recipe. And if everything runs uh, according to plan, then let me call this the ideal plan even. So we are speaking about a self-consistent method because we, we sort of uh, make a, a sort of a bootstrap to, to solve for, the, for these corrections. And it relies heavily on, on the Green's functions of the fluctuations of the fields. So all quantities of interest can be expressed through the Green's functions. And therefore, uh, well, I guess the name is very fitting. Um, so step number one is to find the bounds. I will give you more details on, on this soon, but this is just so you have an, an overview on, on, on what we did. So once you have your bounds, your background, then you can proceed to step number two. So you expand your theory around this interesting background and you consider the fluctuations on the fields on the different sectors. So you can solve for the Green's functions uh, for, for per sector. You, know, you will get then this dress uh, propagators if you want. And once you have them, you can compute the 1PI terms, the usual log that terms that appear in the effective action. Now with those, you can again take a functional derivative. Now, this is where the, the, the new uh, contributions start appearing because in the usual coleman weinberg treatment, we can see that this uh, uh, field here is usually a fixed value. So this, would immediately give you zero. Namely, you won't have any tadpole contribution. Well, here, since we have a non-homogeneous background, then we have some uh, field configuration here, which is, uh, well, position dependent and varying in space. So this derivative will be non-zero and will give you this quantity, which we call the, the tadpole. So pi times phi is just a definition. This doesn't mean that pi, uh, phi can be really factored out. From, from the right side, right, right hand side. But nevertheless, we, we call them tadpole uh, functions. So once we have this, we see that this will appear again on the equation of motion that defines the bounds. So the bounds will have some corrections, delta phi. And this is what we will compute in the end and plug back in and at finally uh, report on the, on the contributions to these exponents of the decay rate. So having this uh, in mind, all we're after is computing this uh, B, B1, and B2 that I showed you that appear in the, in the exponent of this decay rate. And the way to do it is by means of this self-consistent method that relies on Green's functions. Now I will try to go into every step. And uh, of course, there's plenty of details in, in, in between, but uh, feel free to ask. So how do you, wh why do we call uh, this configuration a bounce even? So why, what's, what's bouncing here? So let me first say what is exactly the, the, the bounce. The bounce is a classical solution to the equations of motion, which enjoys an O4 symmetry, meaning uh, it depends really on, on just one coordinate. Now the picture 
that we can have in our heads is something like this. So this is a solution such that it starts in, in, on the false vacuum, uh, phi sub plus, phi plus. It starts rolling down in, in our Euclidean inverted potential and it reaches some turning point in the vicinity of phi minus, our true vacuum. Then it falls back and reaches again at infinity, at time uh, plus infinity, the false vacuum again. Therefore, the name bounds. Now we can transform the, the, the sexual boundary conditions to, to their O4 version. So we will speak about just some radius. So we, we, we just uh, write the bounds as depending on R. And once we do that, this actually uh, just means uh, the, the field phi will have a profile as the one I showed you in the beginning. So a center region, which is in the true vacuum, and a an, an outer region which is in the in the false vacuum. Um, additionally, we will use this so-called thin wall approximation. This means mathematically in the equation we will neglect this friction term, so all linear derivatives will be ignored. And additionally, um, it means that the vacua will find themselves at the same level, so both. Um, vacua, both local minima have the same height and are degenerate. Um, another way to think about this is by means of a hyperspherical harmonics expansion. So as an ansatz to this uh, equation, you might suggest to, to take a hyperspherical harmonic expansion, just as, in, as one does in, in, in three dimensions. And this is equivalent then to neglecting higher angular momentum um, contributions. So we're, we're just keeping L0. That's another way of seeing this. So this is a, a first approximation that we do. Now, uh, once we go uh, to, to the equation of motion in our particular model, uh, of, because of this uh, power to the six that we had, we, we didn't find any analytical solution. So we don't have an analytical expression for the bounds. Namely, we are forced to do from step one onwards uh, everything in numerical terms. So we have to, uh, to yeah, deal, deal with just computational uh, power. Okay, so once you have a bounce, be it analytical or numerical, what you can do is you can expand your theory. So you can take your scalar field and expand it around your background. So this is our bounce again. And we consider real fluctuations, which we will call phi hat and a goldstone direction. And if you do that, and you consider your uh, Lagrangian up to quadratic order, because uh, you're considering just loops, uh, then this is what it looks like. So here we have the effective action to, to one loop. And it has a tree level part and the, the, the famous log dead terms that appear in, at, at this level. Now, this has been treated, uh, these terms have the fluctuation operator associated to uh, each sector. And these ones, the black ones have already been dealt with in the past because they are relatively simple. While the new part comes in, comes in here in the blue term because uh, sadly it is a, a, a coupled block. So we have the gauge field coupled to the cold stone in, in a annoying way. Now, these fluctuation operators look like this. So the two simple ones are one line because they are just one component and diagonal. So they are essentially a Laplacian plus some effective mass coming from the background. Nothing uh, extremely new. However, uh, this gauge goldstone sector has a, a, a matrix, which is essentially five times five. So here, this upper block is actually uh, four by four, and this is just the last row and column corresponding to, to G. Uh, as you can see here in orange, we already see the gradients of the, of the background coming into play. So they appear in the off diagonal and they keep the gauge uh, field coupled to the goldstone. So that's one of the roles of the gradients here. Um, also, we have the gauge choice here. So all the, all the uh, places in which 
our, our gauge choice matters are displayed in blue. And well, they also appear in the off diagonal and they also uh, uh, contribute to this uh, coupling of the gauge field and the goal sum. Now, um, let me remind you, I have said it, but just in case, the common Weinberg case is the case in which these guys are a fixed value. And therefore we call that an homogeneous case. So the background for those cases is, is homogeneous, is, is constant. And uh, the role it will play for us uh, in this study is that of a measuring stick. So we will compute things in, in, for, for this case, for the annoying case, and we will compare our results against the coleman weinberg treatment to have some idea of uh, how good or how bad they are. Now, um, more simplifications and assumptions are needed now to deal with this uh, annoying block. So what we did first uh, was to employ this planar wall approximation or also th three plus one decomposition where we assume we're dealing with a bubble uh, uh, of such size that the radius is big enough as to consider the wall to be flat. So we think that for tangential directions, um, the geometry is not important and the, they can be treated as if they were on a, on a flat, flat surface. Mathematically, that means we can Fourier transform them separately. So we will Fourier transform the A1, A2, and A3 directions, or the momentum actually associated to derivatives in the one, two, and three directions. And um, well, express all the dynamics, focus all the dynamics on, on the radial direction. Now, also as a starting point, we will choose a simple gauge. So the simplest gauge one can choose is probably where psi and theta are equal to one, in which case this uh, block that was annoying decouples a bit. So if I go again to this matrix that we're trying to simplify, what will happen after these two simplifications is that we will have A1, A2, and A3 components diagonal and decoupled. And we will have a sub block of two by two, which look, will look like this, but just for the fourth component and the gallstone field. So just in case, maybe if it's uh, not clear yet, uh, this fluctuation operator is to be understood as acting on a vector having A1, A2, A3, A4, and G. And after these simplifications, A1, A2, and A3 parts become diagonal. And we are just left with a two by two block, which has to be uh, well faced. Great. So now we can actually go to step number two. So we have a bounce, and step number two is finding our Green's functions. Um, if you like to think about what we're doing graphically, this is how it would it would look like. So for the Feynman fans out there, the first two the first two rows uh, represent tadpoles. So these are insertions of the fluctuations here, and the crosses are insertions of the background itself. The continuous line represents the fluctuations around the scalar, while the dotted represents the fluctuations around the ghost field. The wiggly line will be the fluctuations uh, in the directions A1, A2, and A3 of the gauge field. And this double wiggly line represents the A4 comma G part that remains coupled. Now this doesn't appear directly in, in the effective in the in the B one that we had, so not in the effective action, but they are combine themselves to modify the bounds and appear in these dumbbell diagrams in the in the B two term. So these quantities are what we're after in this expanded theory. Now in detail, how to solve them? So first of all, I mentioned. We use this radial direction to, to, to concentrate the, the dynamics. And this radial direction, let me call Z. So Z goes in principle, it, it's, it's a linear coordinate that goes from minus infinity to infinity. We just uh, fix the bound such that the wall lies at zero and we extend it on both directions and treat it as if it was a linear coordinate. And for the sake of numerics, we compactify it. So the radius is renamed Z and now I rename it again to U, which just runs between minus one and one. And the way to solve for the diagonal components, uh, at least the, the way that we did 
was to fix one of the points. So let's say I'm after g uh, u comma u prime. So I fix a u prime and split the function into a left and right function. So here theta is a heavy side distribution, is a step function. So our job is to find the functions on the right and the functions on the left. So we do that by solving the, the corresponding differential equation and gluing them properly. So we demand continuity and the uh, appropriate jump in the derivative. And this will provide you with, with the solutions to the diagonal components. So at this point, if you do this procedure, you will find the Green's functions for this expanded theory for the scalar, the ghost, and the a1, 2, and 3 directions. So uh, let's say all components are done, dealt with. Now the complicated part. The complicated part is this two by two little block that remains coupled. And for this little block, we have to separate the, the problem even further. So we will separate it into two. One part is the one that corresponds to small values of the momentum in the tangential direction. So this k here is the momentum going along the wall of the bubble. And this, if, it, if the modulus of this momentum is uh, less than the coupling times the gradients, then it happens to be the case that our previous method also works. So all we have to do is just go here, do, go to this splitting and do, do the splitting per entry. So just make everything here into a matrix. So per entry, you have a left and a right function. And now you have to glue properly these eight functions. This works reasonably well for, for small values of the momentum. And um, the problem is once you start going higher, then the method stops working or becomes, becomes first very slow and then actually stops working. So, so we need an, another approach. So for the big values of K, what we do is we separate the fluctuation operator into two pieces. The first piece will contain just the diagonal terms and the uh, uh, second term will uh, have the off diagonal ones. And since we know how to deal with diagonal pieces by, by the previous method, we have already a, a, a starting point. So we have an M0 to begin with. And if this is just a fluctuation, it turns out that one can iterate over the previous solutions through this sort of integral to find the, the, the new, the improved version. So after you improved, uh, you, after you iterate uh, a few times, you converge to some uh, level of tolerance and, and, and you manage to include the gradients up to all, essentially all orders. So this shouldn't be confused uh, with a gradient, gradient expansion. Um, and this way, then you, you obtain the, the, the gauge function for this coupled block for arbitrary uh, K or for a, a big enough uh, a regime of k's, of values of k. Um, here, I show you how things look like so far. So here, the orange dashed line corresponds to the initial ansets. So it just contains the solution to the diagonal terms using our methods. And then um, we iterate. And after around, uh, let's say, 12, 14 iterations, you, you, you arrive to this result where the off-diagonals have grown and also the diagonals acquire some small correction. So great, up to this point, then we've dealt with the Green's functions and now we can uh, just compute the, the quantities of interest. So first thing that we have to compute is the log debt terms that appear explicitly in the effective action. Uh, these we do by means of these uh, spectral methods. So we expand uh, or deform or fluctuation operator with an, a parameter s. So we, we essentially add s times the identity. And the impact that this has is, is seen very easily in the spectral decomposition. So if you were to expand this fluctuation operator in its, uh, through its, uh, as a sum of its uh, spectrum, then you have something like this. And when you add the s parameter, you're just shifting the spectrum by an amount s. Uh, when you do this, then, you can see that if you do an integral on this uh, auxiliary parameter, you, you obtain already something that is proportional to a log. And then if you switch this log debt for a trace log, 
then you can you can argue that this identity holds. So th this is the way you derive this identity. So this allows you to express this log dead terms as a two integrals on the difference of Green's functions, where one is evaluated on the background, on the new background, or on, on the on the inhomogeneous background. And uh, for reasons of regularization, you can see here, we have to subtract some reference level, which is a fixed value. And the fixed value that we use is a false vacuum. So at the end of the day, the log dead terms are computed as in the formula below. This log dead of a numerator evaluated on the bounds over a denominator evaluated on your reference vacuum. Of course, this has to be done up to some cutoff, and I will probably speak about this uh, later. So now we have step number three fulfilled. We have our log dead terms. We're missing the tadpoles. So the actual diagrams uh, look like this. So these are terms that come from the how the potential looks specifically. So this one, this one, and this one is coming essentially from, from, the, uh, from the specific form of our potential. And here we have, uh, I, I've written them with M, but they are the same. Gs, I mean, they are the Green's functions per sector. So you can see that once you have your Green's functions, it's just a matter of performing an extra integral along the momenta on the, on the wall. And this will, will produce directly your tadpoles for every sector. So this is not uh, too, too, too hard. Now, the problem of renormalization, of renormalizability, of course, starts to kick in and most of the quantities that we have computed are cutoff dependent, are highly cutoff dependent. So um, we have to remove this uh, somehow. The way to do this is to add to our Lagrangian some, a set of uh, counter terms for the couplings and for the wave function. And uh, somehow they will uh, subtract the divergences, right? The way to do this, since we are using a numerical treatment, we needed some analytical version uh, that an analytical uh, approximation to these divergences. And the way to do it uh, was to employ actually the Kolman Weinberg version. So, this is one of the integrals in, in the, let's say, log debt uh, terms in the Kolman Weinberg evaluation. So, you would plug here some fixed value, and it turns out you can solve this analytically in terms of, a, of, of, the, of the cutoff, and then subtract accordingly. Uh, well, obtain your counter terms by imposing some renormalization scheme. So what we did was just take MS and we subtract just the, the divergent parts uh, that were obtained through these sort of expressions. So this has to be done per sector. And once you do this expansion per sector, you can obtain the counter terms for the couplings. Now, it's worth mentioning uh, that we have to add this uh, power to the eighth counter term because of course our potential is non-renormalizable. So from the start, we expected to need uh, this extra term to be able to account for all divergences. And uh, the other thing is the wave function renormalization. So sadly, uh, this common one treatment, of course, doesn't include any information on gradients. Therefore, it also does not include any information on the divergence of the gradients. And that we had to deal uh, as well in, in a separate way. So yeah, delta Z, another new problem. Um, okay, here uh, I will try to briefly explain how we dealt with it. So this is a subset of the terms appearing in, in our effective action. So you can understand this first line as our Green's function, complete, full. Uh, then we subtract the homogeneous part. So this subtraction uh, leaves gradients alone. And then this, we add this term and we subtract the same term. So K, S and K are the same term essentially, just modulo one auxiliary integral, but we add and subtract the same term. Uh, why? Because this K will contain the divergences associated to the wave function. And our new job is to, to essentially find K and um, Let's see how, how it can be subtract. So the, the objective is that this first line is cutoff independent, that this first line does not depend anymore on the gradients because the homogeneous ones were subtracted here and the gradient ones will be subtracted here. 
Now, this is just the, the renormalization terms associated to the Coleman Weinberg term for completeness, the kinetic term, and then here uh, the term that we have to deal with and find out. Now, uh, some methods around this were, were already developed here, and they rely on, on a mixed expansion between uh, uh, using both momentum and position simultaneously. So we shift uh, by conjugation the, the effective action, and we do some separation of the fluctuation operator into some diagonal piece, uh, free piece, so a diagonal that only includes derivatives, plus a diagonal part that includes the uh, effective masses and a of the an off diagonal part that includes the gradient, the gradients of the background, and this is the blue part. So this is the, the this m two to the minus one. So it includes essentially the gradients, and it turns out that once you expand uh, in this gradient expansion after you uh, conjugated this, the the effective action, you can uh, see that the the terms that contain uh, the terms proportional to gradients are coming out from here and they look like this, like the ones that I write here. And once you, you've done this, you, you can extract then the, the counter term for the wave function and you're, you obtain finite quantities. So just a summary of our devils before I give you the results. Um, these are some of the details that go in between the, the lines in this recipe. So. Uh, let me start with the tuning of the potential. So in order for us to use the thin wall approximation, which is somehow connected to the, the functional determinants being finite, um, we were forced to tune the potential so that the vacuum were um, degenerate at the Coleman Weinberg level. So the, the, the Coleman Weinberg level is actually our starting point where we find the bounds for that theory and then we actually plug it back and, and, and follow our recipe. So the price we have to pay for this is to include uh, extra terms coming from having an expansion around some almost subtle point, and we have to compensate for this. Um, we also have to deal with renormalization, as I explained. So yes, we need a higher dimensional operator, and uh, we have to deal with the wave function renormalization uh, by other means, so that was uh, devil number two, I guess, and devil number three, and the more the most uh, costly, perhaps, was the numerical implementation of this. So, for to obtain this Green's functions uh, for the two by two block, uh, some computational power is required because you need to constantly per iteration find this two point function uh, completely. So you have some scanning happening on in two dimensions, and then you have to iterate this solution a couple of times. So all in all, um, we were forced to use the, 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 the department's cluster. Uh, otherwise, we, this would have been impossible. Um, also, that is just for a fixed uh, value of the momentum going along the tangential direction. So this, also must, this must also be scanned for us to be able to reconstruct the full Green's function. So yeah, th this were, were, were some numerical challenges. Now. Once we've tackled these devils, we can come to the results. So let me give you three slides of results and we will be done. So first, uh, here we see the tadpole contributions. The first plot on the upper uh, left is a total tadpole contribution. So all sectors added up before uh, we renormalized. So the orange line, the orange solid line corresponds to the Coleman-Weinberg treatment. So gradients being ignored. And the diamonds are our results, are the results of our, of our computation. And we can see that they agree uh, reasonably well. However, um, this is just a fairest uh, indication that we're doing something right, but it's not the full story because here we have, of course, uh, results that are dominated by the cutoff. Uh, however, if we take the ratio, uh, we see that they differ by just tenths of a percent. And uh, well, we have this where the potential becomes uh, zero, so it's fine. Now, after renormalization, here it's the, it, it is depicted what one obtains uh, for the total tadpole contribution once renormalization is taken into account. The dashed line represents the Coleman-Weinberg case, so 
for reference again, no gradients. And once we include the gradients of the background, we obtain the solid blue line. So already at this point, this is uh, something that is expected to be physical. So this uh, is already a renormalized uh, quantity. And we can see that the gradients are, are already visually having an impact on, on the solution. Now, same thing here. However, we add for, for as a cross check, the, the tree level part. So we have here U prime plus the tadpole contribution renormalized. And we can notice that at the endpoints, we go back to zero because uh, as I mentioned already, our bounce was a solution to the common Weinberg level. So since the bounce at uh, infinity at, uh, and at zero or minus infinity, if you will, becomes flat, uh, no gradients are expected. So at the edges of our uh, box, if you, if you want, we have zero derivatives, zero gradients, and this means the field is just sitting on, on the minima. Therefore, this should go to zero, being a derivative of the potential, which we can cross-check. Um, OK, so now we can separate. So just remember this graph on, 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 on your head. And I'll go to the, ne the next slide, and I'll separate it into sectors. So if I separate it into sectors, you can see that the graph is almost here. So this is the scalar sector alone. And we can conclude then the, that the scalar is basically the one uh, contributing the most to the tadpole. We can see that essentially all, all of it, or almost all of it, comes from the, from the scalar. Again, dash represents the homogeneous case and solid, the one with gradients. Now, here we have the ghosts. Again, notice just the size of it. So yes, the gradients have an impact, but the impact overall of the tadpole of the ghosts on the tuple is very small. Here we have the interesting uh, sector of the A4, G, dashed again, uh, no gradients, and blue with the gradients. So although the total contribution to the tuple coming from the gauge sector is not that big as compared to the scalar, we can see that the gradients, however, have a great impact on, on this sector. So the, the gradients are, are, are very important for the, for the gauge uh, comma G uh, block. Now, the last uh, graph has, uh, again, the same sector. But we add, just for a reference, this dashed gray line, which is what we obtain uh, before doing the wave function renormalization. So if we were not to do the wave function renormalization or forget or ignore that, then we here we can see how, how different results we would have been having. So it, it's definitely important. To, to do that. It was a, a, a great, great uh, headache for us. Now, here, let me collect all the results. Here, the table shows all the uh, every sector, the B1 contribution per sector. And the last column uh, gives us what we can take home, which is how big are the gradient contributions. So we can see that we can even have up to 1% uh, of impact in relation to the tree level plus uh, low part renormalized with no gradients. So we have here, just in case, it's not very clear. <laughs> it's what we got, uh, the ratio of what we got with respect to the tree level part plus the loops, no gradients. So we can see that the conclusion of this is that gradients count as much as loops. That is what we want to, to convey with our paper. Um, here, we also display the correction to the bounce itself. So we have delta phi over phi. And we can see that the bounce itself receives corrections of a few percent. And we, if we complete the table to obtain B0, B1, and B2, uh, this is what we get. So we get, uh, well, uh, these values for the, bench, the special benchmark point, point that we used, uh, just to confirm uh, the order of magnitude and how the different contributions uh, enter uh, this game. Um, so with, with that said, let me conclude. Um, well, uh, the main uh, goal was to include the gradients in, in this computation. So we managed to include the gradients uh, up to order, up to this uh, one loop order. And what we see is that their contribution is as big 
or comparable to one loop uh, correction. So if you were to, to compute this decay rate uh, up to one loop, because you say one loop, one loop corrections are important, then uh, the argument would be that you should also include gradients because they are equally important. Um, conclusion number two would be perhaps we uh, had to build this uh, code uh, from the start. So <laughs> I myself was, was not supposed to be a computational scientist, but uh, thanks to our, our nice potential, I, I was uh, drawn to, in, into that direction. Um, so we have a, a working code that is able to tackle this uh, coupled block for, for this uh, gauge sector. Uh, also, the method uh, for renormalizing the wave function had to be uh, developed specifically for this case. So that's another, um, well, something to look at if you, if you are interested or in need of these methods. Um, outlook, then, well, now this is just a starting point. Still, our, our set of questions is not fully answered yet. So we want to check other uh, parameters, probably, uh, and also lift some of the assumptions that we made, such as planar wall or thin wall. And um, hopefully, oh, now that we have a working code, move on into changing the gauge choice. So we now want to finally start looking into other gauges and how big is the, is the impact on, on these quantities. And uh, well, once uh, the dust is settled and, and this, uh, uh, the origin of this in, uh, enhancements, en enhancement, let me call it, uh, is, is understood, we can probably move into more realistic models, such as the, the standard model. Um, so that's pretty much it. OK, so thank you very much for this nice talk. Are there questions? I have a question. OK. So if you are forced to work numerically, why do you need to uh, consider the thing wall approximation? Why not just consider the general case? Well, it is not a must. So it, it is just the first approach, which makes some of the things uh, simpler. So it is an assumption. Um, the thing that we were looking after specifically was uh, some problems at the edges with the functional determinants, which numerically uh, would give you some infinities, uh, some, some problems. And we wanted to, to, to avoid uh, dealing with those uh, as a first approach. Now that we more or less have a, a better grip on the problem, we can probably add higher angular momentum contributions as to go farther away from the thin wall. OK, more questions? Okay, so thank you once again for this talk and bye. Thanks.